You are listening to Hubble Audio's production of The Attributes of God, Volume 2, by A. W. Tozer. This book is read by Michael Kramer. This book is 199 pages long and is divided into ten chapters. This recording was produced in 2006 by Hubble Audio, which owns the copyright. No portion of this recording may be reproduced for any reason without prior written consent from Hubble Audio. This edition is issued by contractual arrangement with Wingspread Publishers. The Attributes of God, Volume 2, by A. W. Tozer, was originally published in 2001 by Christian Publications, Incorporated, copyright 2001, by Zur Limited. The first Wingspread Publishers edition was published in 2006, all rights reserved. Please visit www.hovelaudio.com and www.christianaudio.com to offer your impressions of this work and to explore additional titles. The Attributes of God, Volume 2 Deeper into the Father's Heart by A. W. Tozer Introduction God's Character And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Psalm 9, verse 10 In the messages that follow, we will consider that which is behind all things. There could be no more central or important theme. If you trace effect back to cause, and that cause back to another cause, and so on, back through the long dim corridors of the past, until you come to the primordial atom out of which all things were made, you will find the one who made them. You'll find God. Behind all previous matter, all life, all law, all space, and all time, there is God. God gives to human life its only significance. There isn't any other apart from Him. If you take the concept of God out of the human mind, there is no other reason for being among the living. We are, as Tennyson said, like sheep or goats that nourish a blind life within the brain. And we might as well die as sheep unless we have God in our thoughts. God is the source of all law and morality and goodness, the one that you must believe in before you can deny Him, the one who is the Word, and the one that enables us to speak. I'm sure you will see immediately that, in attempting a series of messages about the attributes of God, we run into that which is difficult above all things. The famous preacher Sam Jones, who was a Billy Sunday before Billy Sunday's time, said that when the average preacher takes a text, it reminds him of an insect trying to carry a bale of cotton. And when I take my text and try to talk about God, I feel like that insect. Only God can help me. John Milton started to write a book on the fall of man and his restoration through Jesus Christ our Lord. He was to call his book Paradise Lost. But before he dared to write it, he prayed a prayer that I want to pray as well. He prayed to the Spirit, and he said, And chiefly thou, O Spirit, that dost prefer before all temples the upright heart and pure, instruct me. I'd like to say, with no attempt at morbid humility, that, without a pure heart and a surrendered mind, no man can preach worthily about God, and no man can hear worthily. No man can hear these things unless God touches him and illuminates him. And so Milton said, Instruct me, for thou knowest, what in me is dark, illumine, what is low, raise and support, that to the highest of this great argument I may assert the eternal providence and justify the ways of God to men. Who can speak about the attributes of God, his self-existence, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his transcendence, and so on? Who can do that and do it worthily? Who is capable of anything like that? I'm not. So I only have this one hope. As the poor little donkey rebuked the madness of the prophet, and as the rooster crowed one night to arouse the apostle and bring him to repentance, so God may take me and use me. As Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of the little donkey, so I pray that he may be willing to ride out before the people on such an unworthy instrument as I. It is utterly necessary that we know this God, this one that John wrote about, this one that the poet speaks about, this one that theology talks about, and this one that we are sent to preach and teach about. 
It is absolutely, utterly, and critically necessary that we know this one, for, you see, man fell when he lost his right concept of God. As long as man trusted God, everything was all right. Human beings were healthy and holy, or at least innocent, and pure and good. But then the devil came along and threw a question mark into the mind of the woman. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said... Genesis chapter 3 verse 1. This was equivalent to sneaking around behind God's back and casting doubt on the goodness of God. And then began the progressive degeneration downward. When the knowledge of God began to go out of the minds of men, we got into the fix that we're in now. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man, and to birds, and four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed for ever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind, to do those things which are not convenient. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 28. This first chapter of Romans ends with a terrible charge of unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, and all the long black list of crimes and sins that man has been guilty of. All that came about because man lost his confidence in God. He didn't know God's character. He didn't know what kind of God God was. He got all mixed up about what God was like. Now the only way back is to have restored confidence in God. And the only way to have restored confidence in God is to have restored knowledge of God. I began with the text, And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Psalm 9, verse 10. The word name means character plus reputation. And they that know what kind of God thou art will put their trust in thee. We wonder why we don't have faith. The answer is faith is confidence in the character of God, and if we don't know what kind of God God is, we can't have faith. We read books about George Miller and others and try to have faith. But we forget that faith is confidence in God's character. And because we are not aware of what kind of God God is or what God is like, we cannot have faith. And so we struggle and wait and hope against hope. But faith doesn't come because we do not know the character of God. They that know what thou art like will put their trust in thee. It's automatic. It comes naturally when we know what kind of God God is. I'm going to give you a report on the character of God to tell you what God is like. And if you're listening with a worthy mind, you'll find faith will spring up. Ignorance and unbelief drag faith down, but a restored knowledge of God will bring faith up. I don't suppose there is ever a time in the history of the world when we needed a restored knowledge of God more than we need it now. Bible-believing Christians have made great gains in the last forty years or so. We have more Bibles now than we've ever had. The Bible is a bestseller. We have more Bible schools than we've ever had, ever in the history of the world. Millions of tons of gospel literature are being poured out all the time. There are more missions now than we know what to do with. And evangelism is riding high, very high, at the present time. And more people go to church now, believe it or not, than ever went to church before. Now all that has something in its favor. There's no doubt about it. But you know, a man can learn at the end of the year how his business stands by balancing off his losses with his gains. And while he may have some gains, if he has too many losses, he'll be out of business the next year. 
Many of the gospel churches have made some gains over the last years, but we've also suffered one great central loss, our lofty concept of God. Christianity rises like an eagle and flies over the top of all the mountain peaks of all the religions of the world, chiefly because of her lofty concept of God, given to us in divine revelation and by the coming of the Son of God to take human flesh and dwell among us. Christianity, the great church, has for centuries lived on the character of God. She's preached God, she's prayed to God, she's declared God, she's honored God, she's elevated God, she's witnessed to God, the triune God. But in recent times, there has been a loss suffered. We've suffered the loss of that high concept of God, and the concept of God handled by the average gospel church now is so low as to be unworthy of God and a disgrace to the church. It is by neglect, degenerate error, and spiritual blindness that some are saying God is their partner or the man upstairs. One Christian college put out a booklet called Christ is My Quarterback. He always calls the right play. And a certain businessman was quoted as saying, God's a good fellow and I like him. There isn't a Muslim alive in the world who would stoop to calling God a good fellow. There isn't a Jew, at least no Jew who believes in his religion, that would ever dare to refer that way to the great Yahweh, the one with the incommunicable name. They talk about God respectfully and reverently. But in the gospel churches, God is a quarterback and a good fellow. I sometimes feel like walking out on a lot that passes for Christianity. They talk about prayer as going into a huddle with God, as if God is the coach or the quarterback or something. They all gather around, God gives the signal, and away they go. What preposterous abomination! When the Romans sacrificed a sow on the altar in Jerusalem, they didn't commit anything more frightful than when we drag the holy, holy, holy God down and turn him into a cheap Santa Claus that we can use to get what we want. Christianity has lost its dignity, and we'll never get it back unless we know the dignified, holy God who rides on the wings of the wind and makes the clouds his chariots. We have lost the concept of majesty and the art of worship. I got a letter from my good friend Stacy Woods, who was until recently head of InterVarsity, and he said this in the closing lines of his letter. The church is getting away from worship. I wonder if it is because we are getting away from God. I think he's right, and I believe that is the answer. And then our religion has lost its inwardness. For Christianity, if it's anything, is an inward religion. Jesus said that we are to worship in spirit and in truth, and yet we've lost it because we have lost the concept of deity that makes it possible. Even though we've hung on to our Schofield Bible and still believe in the seven main doctrines of the fundamental faith, we've lost the awe, the wonder, the fear, and the delight. Why? Because we've lost God, or at least we've lost our high and lofty concept of God, the only concept of God that He honors. And so the gains we have made have all been external. Bibles and Bible schools, books and magazines and radio messages, missions and evangelism, numbers and new churches. And the losses we've suffered have all been internal. The loss of dignity and worship and majesty, of inwardness, of God's presence, of fear and spiritual delight. If we have lost only that which is inward and gained only that which is outward, I wonder if we've gained anything at all. I wonder if we are not now in a bad state. I believe we are. I believe our gospel churches, our Christianity is thin and anemic, without thoughtful content, frivolous in tone and worldly in spirit. And I believe that we are desperately in need of a reformation that will bring the church back. I quit using the word revival because we need more than a revival. When the great Welsh revival came to the little country of Wales around the turn of the century, the Holy Ghost had something to work with. The people believed in God and their concept of God was lofty. But because the church has lost her lofty concept of God and no longer knows what God is like, her religion is thin and anemic, frivolous and worldly and cheap. Compare the preaching of the church today with that of the Hebrew prophets, or even of men like Charles Finney, if you dare to do it. 
how serious these men of God were. They were men of heaven, come to earth to speak to men. As Moses came down from the mount with his face shining to speak to men, so the prophets and preachers down through the years went out. Serious-minded men they were, solemn men, lofty in tone and full of substance of thought and theology. But today the preaching, to a large extent, is cheap, frivolous, coarse, shallow, and entertaining. We in the gospel churches think that we've got to entertain the people, or they won't come back. We have lost the seriousness out of our preaching, and have become silly. We have lost the solemnity, and have become fearless. We have lost the loftiness, and have become coarse and shallow. We have lost the substance, and have become entertainers. This is a tragic and terrible thing. Compare the Christian reading matter, and you'll know that we're in pretty much the same situation. The Germans, the Scots, the Irish, the Welsh, the English, the Americans, and the Canadians all have a common Protestant heritage. And what did they read, these Protestant forebears of yours and mine? Well, they read Doddridge's The Rise and Progress of Religion in the Soul. They read Taylor's Holy Living and Dying. They read Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress and Holy War. They read Milton's Paradise Lost. They read the sermons of John Flavel. And I blush today to think about the religious fodder that is now being handed out to children. There was a day when they sat around as the fire crackled in the hearth and listened to a serious but kindly old grandfather read Pilgrim's Progress, and the young Canadian and the young American grew up knowing all about Mr. Facing Both Ways and all the rest of that gang. And now we read cheap junk that ought to be shoveled out and gotten rid of. Then I think about the songs that are sung now in so many places. Ah, oh, the roster of the sweet singers. There's Watts, who wrote, O oh God, Our Help in Ages Past, and Zinzendorf, who wrote so many great hymns. And then there was Wesley, who's written so many. There was Newton, and there was Cooper, who wrote, There is a fountain filled with blood and Montgomery and the two Bernards, Bernard of Cluny and Bernard of Clairvaux. There was Paul Gerhardt and Terstegen. There was Luther and Kelly, Addison and Toplady, Senek and Doddridge, Tate and Brady, and the Scottish Psalter. And there was a company of others that weren't as big as these great stars, but taken together they made a milky way that circled the Protestant sky. I have an old Methodist hymnal that rolled off the press 111 years ago, and I found 49 hymns on the attributes of God in it. I have heard it said that we shouldn't sing hymns with so much theology because people's minds are different now. We think differently now. Did you know that those Methodist hymns were sung mostly by uneducated people? They were farmers and sheep herders and cattle ranchers, coal miners and blacksmiths, carpenters and cotton pickers plain people all over this continent. They sang those songs. There are over eleven hundred hymns in that hymn book of mine, and there isn't a cheap one in the whole bunch. And nowadays I won't even talk about some of the terrible junk that we sing. They have a little one that is sung to the tune of There'll Be a Hot Time in the Old Town Tonight, which goes like this. One, two, three, the devil's after me. Four, five, six, he's always throwing bricks. Seven, eight, nine, he misses me every time. Hallelujah, amen. And the dear saints of God sing that now. Our fathers sang, O God, our help in ages past, and we sing junk. This tragic and frightening decline in the spiritual state of the churches has come about as a result of our forgetting what kind of God God is. We have lost the vision of the majesty on high. I have been reading in the book of Ezekiel over the last weeks, reading slowly and rereading, and I have just come to that terrible, frightening, awful passage where the Shekinah, the shining presence of God, lifts up from between the wings of the cherubim, goes to the altar, lifts up from the altar, goes to the door, and there is the sound of the whirring of wings. Ezekiel chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. And then the presence of God goes from the door to the outer court, chapter 10, verses 18 through 19, and from the outer court to the mountain, chapter 11, verse 23, and from the mountain into the glory. And it has never been back, except as it was incarnated in Jesus Christ when he walked among us. But the Shekinah glory that had followed Israel about all those years, that shone over the camp, 
was gone. God couldn't take it any longer, so he pulled out his majesty, his Shekinah glory, and left the temple. And I wonder how many gospel churches, by their frivolousness, shallowness, coarseness, and worldliness, have grieved the Holy Ghost until he's withdrawn in hurt silence. We must see God again. We must feel God again. We must know God again. We must hear God again. Nothing less than this will save us. I'm hoping that you will be prayerful, and that you'll be worthy to hear this, and that I'll be worthy to speak about God, the triune God, the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, what He's like. If we can restore again knowledge of God to men, we can help in some small way to bring about a reformation that will restore God again to men. I want to close with these words of Frederick Faber. Full of glory, full of wonders, majesty divine, Mid thine everlasting thunders how thy lightnings shine. Shoreless ocean, who shall sound thee? Thine own eternity is round thee, majesty divine. One hour with the majesty of God will be worth more to you now and in eternity than all the preachers, including myself, that ever stood up to open their Bible. I want a vision of the majesty of God, not as that song says, one transient gleam. No, I don't want anything transient. I want the gleam of majesty and wonder to be permanent. I want to live where the face of God shines every day. No child says, Mother, let me see your face transiently. The child wants to be where any minute of the hour he can look up and see his mother's face. Timeless, spaceless, single, lonely, yet sublimely three, thou art grandly always only God in unity. Lone in grandeur, lone in glory, who shall tell thy wondrous story, awful trinity? Splendors upon splendors beaming, change and intertwine, glories over glories streaming, all translucent shine. Blessings, praises, adorations greet thee from the trembling nations, majesty divine. This is the day of the common man. And we have not only all become common, but we've dragged God down to our mediocre level. What we need so desperately is an elevated concept of God. Maybe by faithful preaching and prayer and by the Holy Ghost we can see the splendors upon splendors beaming, change and intertwine. Maybe we can see glories over glories streaming, all translucent shine. To God we can give blessings, praises, adorations that... Greet thee from the trembling nations, Majesty Divine. Chapter 1 God's Self-Existence And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Exodus chapter 3, verses 11 through 15. The translators set the words in Exodus, chapter 3, verse 14, I am that I am, in capitals, for that is the name of God, and God's memorial throughout all generations. I am, of course, means, I am the self-existent one. I want to speak about God's divine attribute of self-existence, or God's selfhood. I'll use both of those terms, and probably some others. But before I go on, I ought to say a little bit about a divine attribute— what it is and what it isn't. Now an attribute of God is not that of which God is composed. The very fact that God is God indicates that God isn't composed at all. 
You and I are composed. We're composed of body, soul, mind, spirit, imagination, thought, and memory. We are a composition because there was someone there to compose us. God took clay and his own breath, and as an artist brings the paints to the canvas, God brought all of his genius to the matter and spirit out of which man is made, and he composed man. And so the attributes of man are the component parts. They compose the man. But when we talk about the attributes of God, we have no such idea in mind at all, because he said, I am that I am. Anything that is composed has to have been composed by someone, and the composer is greater than the composition. If God the Father Almighty had been composed, somebody greater than God would have had to be out there to make God. But God is not made. Therefore we cannot say that the attributes of God are the parts of which God is made, because God is not made of parts. God exists in simple unity. I'm a Unitarian, and I'm also a Trinitarian, you see. I believe in the unity of God. And when we say that God is one, if we're scriptural, we do not mean that there is only one God, although that also is true, but we mean that God is one with himself, without parts. God is like a diamond. The diamond is one with itself. God is like gold. It is one with itself. Only that's a poor, cheap illustration. God is infinitely above all that. God's attributes are not God. That is, I say that God is self-existent, but that's something that I posit about God. That isn't God. I say that God is holy, but holiness is not God. I say that God is wisdom, but wisdom is not God. God is God. Would you like a definition of attribute as I shall use it? It is something which God has declared to be true of himself. And one thing God has declared to be true of himself is, I am that I am. I exist. Not I will exist or I did exist, but I do exist. The philosophy of existentialism begins with the propositions, I exist and there is no God. But the Christian believes that God is the original existence, that he said, I am. And because God is, everything else that is, is. An attribute of God is something we can know about God. It is knowing what kind of God God is. In this study of the attributes, we'll try to teach what God is like. Reason must always fall short of God. I was talking to one of the greatest minds in the evangelical world recently, and I asked him, You don't believe, do you, that all that God is can be grasped by our intellects? He responded, If I didn't, I would be an agnostic. I didn't think to say it at the time, but afterward I thought, well, if you believe that everything that God is can be grasped by the intellect, you're not an agnostic, you're a rationalist. That is rationalism, pure and simple, the belief that I can understand anything God says and anything God is if there is a God. The idea that my brain is the criterion of all things, that's rationalism. And rationalism almost always follows a rigid, hard orthodoxy because it says, in effect, I know God, I understand God, I can grasp God. But the truth is that God rises transcendently above all that we can understand. The human mind must kneel before the great God Almighty. What God is can never quite be grasped by the mind. It can only be revealed by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit does not reveal what I am trying to tell you about God, then you only know about God. The little song says, More about Jesus would I know, but it isn't more about Jesus that the heart craves after. It's Jesus himself. It is the knowledge of God, not the knowledge about God. I might know all about the Prime Minister of Canada, but I don't know him. I've never met him. From what I hear and read in the speeches I've heard him make, I suppose he's a fine gentleman. If I were to live with him a while, travel with him, eat with him, talk with him, I suppose I'd get to know him. But now I only know about him, that's all. I know about him, his age, background, etc., but I don't know him. And so when we talk about the attributes of God, we're talking about his essential essence, of which he says, I am.
but we're talking only about that which the intellect can grasp. Thank God there are some things the intellect can know about God.